capital of the world because of climate, mostly, um, and most of the ingredients for beer are grown in this sort of latitude, so it's easy to get uh, the grain, the hops, all of it, and water's plentiful, and it's delicious, so when you have all that stuff mixed together. It's the latitude, I guess, where hops grow best, so we're kind of primed for that, and that's why we have a lot of IPAs and pails here. What I really like is the diversity of beers and ingredients. I just had a saison with peppercorn in it, and there's a fresh squeezed IPA. It's just so many uh, versatile ingredients I have. Craft brewing is just a really fine art, and one of the things that we really pride ourselves in um, with the shoots is we use only full flower pots, whereas a lot of other breweries will use pellets or um, you know, substances that aren't necessarily um, full hops. Why do you think Portland has so many breweries? I just feel like it's got a really good um, beer-esque town. It's just one of those towns that people love beer, we love um, food, we love kind of hanging out, and um, I just feel like people really appreciate craft beer um, in Portland. Um, I think that there's a really great market for it here, um, and that everything is slightly different, um, and it's really kind of exciting. It's, um, it's new. Um, everybody's just really, really jazzed about it. And what makes you personally like the beer market in Portland or the beer culture? I like it because it's got a lot of, like I said, very different. Um, you know, you can go to one place and find a, a Hellas or a, a all beer or something that's very different, maybe a little more rare, and you can go to other places and find pilsners, lagers, stouts, that kind of thing that are maybe a little bit more popular. Um, so you have a really wide variety and everybody does something a little differently. Beer, what? Oh, yeah. Safeway was a fertilizer factory, and this was run down, vacant warehouse space. This is a, probably one of the roughest neighborhoods in town yeah. when we started here. That. Now it's the new Pearl District, but the whole industry started right here. And then we had to wait for a little more legislation change before we can actually open up the pubs. Mm -hmm. We're going to run about 150,000 bottles daily off the bottling line here. Wow. We have a staff of four people, and everything we use is locally produced. Pallets, shrink wrap. Cardboard, the bottles, everything. It's amazing. We run about 150,000 bottles a day out of this tiny little area. And our staff is four people. Five Just people four people? Yeah. We have seven or eight brewers. We got four or five people packaging. We have a state of the art laboratory here. Microbiologist, let's go down to a couple of It's one of the most advanced brewing labs in the nation. We actually have a couple of microbiologists on staff, and we grow a strain of yeast from two single cell organisms. We have two here in Oregon at the brewery, and we keep two in another region around the world in case we had a large catastrophe or earthquake or fire. Mm -hmm. The lab is destroyed. We can choose at some point to rebuild, and we can. We have two more other cultures. We go from Copenhagen, Denmark, to a new yeast, yeast laboratory in Quebec, Canada. Nice. So if we had any, uh, you know, earthquake or building caught on fire, we could rebuild, and at one point we could bring one of the other two cells to Oregon and start producing the strain just from a single cell. Yeah, my beer menu is pretty close to like our food menu. Uh -huh. So a lot of the offerings are just limited, seasonal, fresh releases. 
kind of like the daily specials. So we get to feature limited window ingredients and things that are kind of hard to get. So yeah. half the stuff's reoccurring that we want to continue making all the time. The other half's kind of trying to feature. It's like shopping at your local farmer's market. Mm -hmm. or, uh, fermentation is actually the yeast and the starches from the grains uh, are a food source for the yeast. And when the yeast consumes that, it produces alcohol and CO2 as byproducts. So we're doing tests, oxygen tests. Uh, the yeast we grow gets a little bit older, so we get many uses, and then many generations off the mother culture, and then many pitches or uses. So it's not quite the same, it uh, gets a little bit older, it's not quite as efficient. Right. Mm -hmm. So we actually pull samples every day, and for the fermentation, we're actually gonna pull individual samples from different tanks, bring them over here, and then we can accelerate the fermentation process from one to two weeks in the brew house to 24 to 48 hours here in the laboratory. And the test results tell us exactly how much yeast we need for that particular tank of beer. One of the tanks will fill 340 of those kegs or 50,000 12 ounce bottles. liquid waste in the brewery, maybe kegs come back with a little bit of leftover beer in them. We put it in this tank here. We have a farmer, has a little tanker truck, comes down, fills it up, takes it back to the farm, sprays it over the crops for all the nutrients in it. Uh, the blue line over there is recycling, paper, tin, plastic. We separate out the fryer oil from the kitchen when we're done. There's a little container around the corner you can't really see from here. A uh, friend of ours comes, buys that off us, turns it into biodiesel. This is the kitchen, the heart of the operation. This is where we create all the British Port recipes for the world. Wow. The very small growing system, considering the size of our brand and how much beer we actually create out here. Uh, we're the chefs, so we don't. nothing's automated. We don't run 24 hours a day. Everything's handmade here. It's about eight or 10 hours to get through a whole recipe creation. The first step is working with all the grains. We call that the mash. Uh, in order to create a beer recipe, all the grains have to be processed. You can't use raw grains. And the reason why is the yeast can't consume starch in the raw form. So it's the enzyme in the barley that breaks the starch down into something that the yeast can actually consume. And the way to wake that enzyme up is actually uh, the grains go to a high-end roaster, very similar to a coffee roaster. And they soak the, the grains in water, it starts that germination process, wakes all those enzymes up, and before it starts to grow into a plant, they actually roast it on a very high-end level. It's a science in itself. You can apply different levels of roast to whatever grains you choose. The high-end malter for the nation happens to be right up the street. And then each brewery has their own little special techniques or little things they have apply for us. So it's like a barbecue off and every chef has their own little, little trick secret. or secret. Exactly. So the level of the roast indicates the color of the beers. Light summer beers will have a light roast, just like coffee beans, a darker roast. And then we get into natural flavors like coffees, chocolates. Those are actually natural flavors based on the grain and the roasting process. When we started the brewery over in 84, we got this piece from the Olympia Brewery in Olympia, Washington. And this is the piece we use as that piece. So we are only making 10 keg recipes when we started. If you want to come around here and get the basket. It's kind of like a combination between making tea and coffee. We're going to put thousands of dollars of the most expensive hops you can get in the world, which happen to grow right up the street, right in this little basket. And I'll allow a little bit of this liquid, or it's called at this point, to circulate through here. So think about maybe the basket of a coffee maker, where you put your coffee grind in, you hit the brew button, a little bit of liquid gets exposure to all the coffee grind, kind of the same philosophy here. There's a little tube that goes through the top, so it actually circulates and steeps like tea. All right, well this is our fresh hop storage. Let me show you some of the hop varieties we have here. Welcome to Bivana. Every variety is uniquely different. Oh my god, look at this. Wow. Oh, it smells oh, so good. These are some of the best tops you can find in the world. They actually grow right up the street here. We have many different varieties. They actually look like little pine cones. So think about different types of cheeses, different styles of roses. So each variety is uniquely different. Uh, these have been dried and pressed. So we can use them all year, and what we're after is actually on the inside. 
So what you want to do is you want to break these open. And see that column there where all the pollen is? That's all produced by something called the lupulin gland. And it also produces a small amount of oil and resin. And as the chefs, that's what we're after. So to get to that, we actually rub them on our hands. We get that oil and resin, get all sticky. Explodes in aromas. Wow. And they're all uniquely different. So pine, pine floral, floral, citrus. You can make your own blends. We can move bitterness around like we can spiciness in food or heat. And every variety is uniquely different. Well, I think when they're talking about the 45th parallel, they're actually talking about a region or a certain area and climate. And that's the climate that actually we're producing some of the best hops and some of the best grape varietals in the world. So Portland, Oregon happens to be a very special place because we have a fantastic water source and the world class ingredients are less than an hour away from the road. So. 45th parallel is what I drive by all the time. It's the landmark when I'm going to Eugene, at home of more great beers. Above and below it, it's all just, you know, in the whole Willamette Valley, it's, it's all really good beer coming out of great water, great hops.